welcome to the Rider Dojo with your host, Steve Diamond. Another glorious day in the core. And Larry Korea. You gonna skin that smoke wagon or stand there and bleed? Today's episode, Third Person Narrative. Everybody, welcome back to the Rider Dojo. Glad to have you back with us today. Now, a few weeks ago, Larry, we talked about, or I don't know, three or four weeks ago, we talked about first person point of view. And I think a lot of our listeners really appreciated it. So what I want to do today is cover the other the other common side of this, which is third person. Yeah, those are the big two. Yeah. Um, you know, and we did we had actually an episode where we compared and contrasted the two, and like tried to say which which is the best style for you to write in. And the answer was it depends. You know, there's not really a right or wrong answer. Yeah, I mean, I. I think it all depends on what you want to do. Uh, in the first person episode, you and I, we talked a lot about how, how we both prefer to write like detective fiction in first person. The funny thing is uh, right after that, after that episode went live, I had a couple people contact me and say um, like, oh, well, I write detective stuff, but I write it in third person very specifically because Good. I can because I can hide information from the reader that way. That's a and I'm like, oh, point. you know what? That's a really good point. That's a very valid point. Um, so again, it all comes down to, well, what do you want to do? Because there, there's no wrong answer here. Yeah. So what we're going for today is we've 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 done our we've done our like no wrong answer compare and contrast uh, and as far as which one you want to write in and, and also we've said that it's really going to depend. Try them both. Write a scene both ways. See which one's more comfortable mm -hmm. for you as a writer. You want to pick the one that flows. But in the first person episode, we got into the nuts and bolts of it, tips and tricks specifically to make your first person better. So that's what we're going to do today is uh, yeah. tips and tricks, how to make your third person feel better. And I think, I think the very first question that I ask myself, Larry, when it comes to what tense am I going to write in, it comes down to why. why. Why would I write this in first person or why would I write this in third person? So when it comes to third person, Larry... Why do you choose that when you do choose that? Biggest reason why is is number of point of view characters. The biggest reason I go third person is if I'm telling the kind of story that I need to jump from head to head to be able to tell different scenes, uh, then I want third person. First person, like I said, it's more condensed. It's more evocative and more emotional. And you're all through one specific narrator. But third person enables me to do a bigger, broader story. So if I'm doing like uh, Hard Magic or Son of the Black Sword, I'm doing those, I get very broad. I usually will have several narrators spread throughout the book. So I'll have one character in each scene as the main character for that scene. Well, that's very much what we do for servants, right? Oh, yeah. Servants, we have four. Mm -hmm. We have basically a main character who's kind of the star. Yep. He's kind of the hero of the book. He, he probably has 50% of the book. Probably. That's about By right. himself. And then the other 50% of the book is divided up between three characters. Right. Uh, and so Ilarion's the hero. He's the main character. And so most of the book's his perspective. But then to tell a broader story, we have, you know, Natalia... Kristoff and Amos, and Amos is probably the smallest. He's he's got. He, he I think he only has like four or five scenes total. Yeah, he's got like four or five scenes from his perspective, and most of those are kind of world building explanatory mm -hmm. scenes because he's kind of the wisest of them. Uh, and then, like I said, Alarian's a big one. Kristoff is all the scenes that are like expanding the nefarious plot. It's the it's all the plot points that the main character is too good. And I, and I don't mean too good as in he's he's like just quality human being. I mean he's he's not evil. <laughs> he's yeah. not an evil person. Yeah. The, he if he's in those situations, I mean he'd be a different character for being in those situations. Right. So we have Kristoff as the point of view character for when we're doing like the nefarious underworld stuff, and then Natalia is actually a different perspective because she's an outsider from this culture who's kind of trapped. She, she's not a prisoner there, but but she's basically a hostage yeah. uh, to serve in this army against her will. So she is our outsider perspective. And so the nice thing about third person is if I want to tell a, a story from like four different points of view, and I'm not just talking character points of view, but I mean like the country boy, uh, honest, good, you know, basic civilian person in that world sucked into this, the nefarious underworld political schemer, the religious scholar outsider, and then the complete outsider 
uh, in this against her will. It enables me to tell a story that's like wide and broad uh, and, and hit different things from different angles. Well, in fact, um, you and I, as, as we've been brainstorming for book two, one of the things that we're kind of tossing around is maybe doing adding another character who from the first book, um, um, Daris, who is a trencher. Yep. Because the if we were to add him in an effective way, it would allow us to tell certain scenes and certain stories from his perspective, um, in a perspective that that um, that again we're going to go back to our to our most favoritist review ever which is not enough rats eating people. If because we want to show the rats eating people, he's the guy to show us that scene. Yeah, because our battle scenes come from the perspective of a guy who's at the command post watching or a guy who is basically kind of a armor, armored cavalry. Uh, or or through this or through this uh, through a scope site. It was a scout sniper. Yeah, and so we we never did like the actual grunts having to get up and run across the mud and barbed wire, and so that's one reason we didn't have enough rats eating people. And and from a storytelling <laughs> perspective, like immediately when I start thinking of that, and I think about him getting up and running across, you know, across you know no man's land, like man. I can think of some cool, evocative storytelling pieces oh, yeah. from that. You know what I mean? Totally. Totally. And, and third person gives us that freedom. Yeah. So the third person, this is, it, it, it enables the broadness. Uh, and, and, and don't get me wrong, first person can have broadness too, and first person can have greater depth, and third person can have greater depth. It's all, it, it's all just tools in the toolbox, guys. Um, now, one of the things to keep in mind is when you're doing this head hopping, to not do too much. Yeah. That's one of the dangers of, of, of third person with multiple narrators. And we talked about this in the character episode where we have like our primary characters, secondary characters, and tertiary characters. Primary characters are who you're telling the story from. Secondary characters are your characters that you haven't, you're visiting, a, you know, less. They're, they're present in, they're present in a lot of scenes. But they're not, you're not seeing the story from them. Yeah, and the tertiary characters are the the least developed, you know, the least, rarely are you going to have a scene from their perspective. You know, but that said, sometimes you do, because I was like, for example, Tom Clancy. Like, yeah. Tom Clancy was hopping from head to head, from scene to scene, to tell whatever part of the big global battle was the most interesting. So we'd have scenes from one person you'd never met before, just because they had the best view of the mm -hmm. battle. And, and it could even be the guy sitting at a computer uh, watching satellite feeds mm -hmm. is all of a sudden the, the main character of that scene in the point of view character narrator. So that is powerful. Just be careful you don't go down too many rabbit holes. A lot of fantasy authors do that. I was going to say, I mean, this, this sounds like George Martin in a nutshell, right? Yeah. Like, don't me wrong. Um, I think there are a number of characters and a number of scenes in his in his books that um, that work. And yet, uh, I remember as I was reading through, and we would get to certain characters, and I'm just like, I don't. Why are you shoving this character on me? Like, I don't care. They're not no interesting. One cares. They're not interesting. They're not doing anything. They're not really doing anything. That interesting. And you just spent like 20, 30 pages on this dude with a story that goes nowhere meandering about. And he's probably he's probably a dirtbag and he's probably gonna die. Yeah, so at a like, certain point, why do I care? Keep in mind, I've only ever read the first Game of Thrones novels, so I'm like See, I've, I've read them all. Yeah. But um You're a tougher man than I am. I I, I do so you don't have to, Larry. It's what heroes do. Um <laughs> <laughs> It was like when I was live tweeting uh, watching uh, Resident Evil. I'm like, I'm watching this so you don't have to, because this is what heroes do. <laughs> well, I was going to say, this is what heroes do, and George Martin has no idea what heroes do. I think that's... His Indeed. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's... It, I think that, you know, our, our normal disclaimer is that if you're awesome, you, you can make anything work, right? Yeah. Um, but I'm going to say, most of you, you're not Tom Clancy, Okay. So if, if you think that you're going to write this huge sprawling epic in third person and you're going to touch on all of the perspectives from all these different points of view, I'm going to say that in general, perhaps it'd be better not to do that 
And it might be in your best interest to get a much more solid hold on your actual main characters. Because if I can tell that same scene from a main character's point of view, then why aren't I just telling it from the main character's point of view? Yeah, it's one of those, it's a balancing act. Mm -hmm. It's really, it's a great tool, but it's really easy to take it too far and go overboard. Mm -hmm. And then that's how you get going down rabbit holes. Because it's just, guys, it's logistics. Um, every scene you do from a new perspective takes up space in the book, takes up time for the reader. And every minute that they are on a person that they're never going to see again, unless there's a really important reason for that then it's probably told better through somebody else. Now, if it said if it's the character you're introducing and you're going to come back to him later, that's great. But once again, don't get too sprawly because then all of a sudden you wind up with a bunch of 800-page books that never go anywhere. Well, and I also think, Larry, that there is almost like there's almost only a, a certain amount of information and a certain amount of characters that a reader can hold in their head at once. That's true. Um, I remember I've seen studies about this or articles about this a long time ago that the human brain can remember about 200 people. Um, and like, like you, as the average person, you can remember about 200 people and everything about them. And like, you know who that person is, you know, their name, you know who they are, you know what they do, all that kind of stuff. And once you get beyond 200 people, you can't keep track of them. And that's also like, like society wise, that's why tribal societies that are tiny can actually get along with very, manage, very, very minimal management or leadership because everybody knows each other. So you have a society where you all know each other's dirt. And so no one can ever be too nasty or horrible to each other because they all know each other and they're all inter interconnected. But then you've got people outside of that and that's when you start needing management. Well, the problem with us writers, and that's why I always joke that I can't remember anybody's name. No offense, guys. I'm sorry. I really can't. There's thousands of you. I can't remember your names. We're accountants. Yeah. If you were an, if you were a named spreadsheet, we'd probably be cool. Yeah. If you had a number and a letter, we'd be good. But the problem is uh, for writers that those 200 spaces of, of, of character identity, those are all taken up by imaginary people. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, I can't remember most of my neighbor's names or my or the people in my ward. I don't remember. I don't know. I'm terrible. At that. It's a good thing I have my wife to manage this. But the reader is going to be the same way. When you're introducing a cast of characters, they're going to remember that like we talked about character names uh, earlier. And they're going to remember names. They're going to remember factoids about people. They're going to put two and two together. But if you grow that cast too large, then it's going to be over their head. Now, one of the things that I do specifically in that I'm very cognizant of that I probably should have talked about in our in our character naming episode, when it comes to th third person and first person, I don't have to worry about it because everything is told from one point of view, right? And to be clear, you can do that in third person too. You can just do the entire book, third person, one entire point of view and never stray. No, we yeah. see that we see that pretty frequently. Actually, yeah, that's done quite a bit. Uh, in fact, I think uh, I think there's quite a few of the Harry Bosch novels that actually do this. Um, but when you are when you're picking your your point of view characters in a third person story, I'm actually very careful that none of the names start with the same letter, that they're all quite divergent, because I don't want like an Amos and an Alex even though I know that's a kind of a bad example because that's what they do in the expanse. But um, I actually don't like that sort of thing because when it comes to that series in particular, I almost always swap the names Oh, just on accident. And, and I don't like that lack of clarity. Okay. I see. I see what you, you see mean. what I mean? Yeah. So if I have an, if I had like an Ilarian and an, in a, um, Ilya, I don't know, or, uh, Natalia and a Natasha. Yeah. You know, like, like I'm starting to put myself in a bad spot. No, that's a good point. I had not never, I never thought of that, but that's a very good point. And so if you look at say servants, we have Amos, Ilarian, Natasha, Natalia. and Christoph. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Natalia. <laughs> See what I mean? See, I say the wrong name and yeah. I get all screwed up. You still had it. Stuck exactly. There. And, and a Christoph. Yeah. And four so, very different, four names. wildly divergent names. And then all the side characters are, Slavic McChenkov. Poor Chenkov. Um, Such a good guy. So anyway, my, my whole point is that when it comes to third person, 
it is very freeing. It is very freeing. I find I actually find it very freeing to write in third person for that sort of reason. Well, you can step back a little bit. Yeah. You can step outside. You can step... So even if you're just writing from one point of view, you can still get out of their head, you know? But we'll talk about omniscient after the break. Ugh. Yeah, because that's a, that's a whole different danger. Yeah, I mean, there's getting... There's getting directly out of the character's head, and then there's getting out of everyone's heads. And that's not something that, that I like particularly. So, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll talk about the dangers of that, and we'll talk about some effective uses of third person that we've written and that we've seen, and we'll talk about some of the issues that we have had, some of the challenges, I think, that we've, that we've encountered as we've been going through this. So, we'll be right back. The war between Al Masia and the Empire of Kolokovia is in its hundredth year. Casualties grow on both sides as the conflict leaves no corner of the world untouched. Alarian Glaskov's quiet life on the fringes of the Empire is thrown into chaos when an impossible tragedy strikes his village. When he is conscripted into the Tsarist military, he is sent to serve in The Wall, an elite regiment that pilots suits of armors made from the husks of dead golems. But the Great War is not the only, or even the worst, danger facing Alarian as he is caught in a millennia-old conflict between two goddesses. He must survive the ravages of trench warfare, horrific monsters from another world, and the treacherous internal politics of the country he serves. Servants of War, New Military Fantasy, by Master of Horror Steve Diamond and international bestseller Larry Correa. Available on Amazon or wherever fine books are sold. Pick up your copy today. Welcome back. All right, Larry, before the break, we, we briefly mentioned the whole idea of the omniscient narrator, and I think we both died inside. Yeah, because we both thought of examples immediately of the um, third-person omniscient narrator. And, and this guy, is, if you don't know what this means, it's like God is narrating the book. Yeah. It's like, it's like the all-seeing, all-knowing narrator is telling you what's going on. And the, the problem with that is it's so big and wide and all-encompassing that it's not how the human brain takes storytelling. It's pretty difficult. Uh, if, you, if you're reading a book that's in third person and from one paragraph to the next, it changes whose perspective you're seeing the scene from and there's no scene break. It's just one paragraph to the next paragraph. Um, that's omniscient. Now, sometimes that's totally unintentional by the author. They just have, they just don't have a firm grasp on point of view. And so they'll make the mistake. Yeah. Honestly, see that like, a lot. that's amateur hour. And that's the kind of thing slush readers look for. Oh yeah. It's like one of the most amateur things ever. And readers hate it and it's almost impossible to pull off and make it and keep in mind, beginning of the show we told you guys there's no rules just suggestions and there are good writers who pull it off um frank herbert frank herbert i mean dune is one of the most famous books of all time uh lots of horror lots uh, and lots of horror a lot of a lot of horror does do omniscient yep. third person omniscient it is doable you're not those people. You're not those people. And also, a lot of it, too, is dated. Yeah. Because you saw that more in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, that's fair. You don't really see it as much now. And I think part of that, too, is is honestly, it will work for certain big things that are classic for some other reason. But then you actually like delve into the book and, it, and it's still a great book because it's a classic and it's got like all this big, deep ideas in it. But like, if you read Dune now, that's kind of a slog. Yeah, right? there are parts of this. I think you and I were talking about this the other day. Because we both love Dune. Yeah, we both love Dune. And and I actually went back because, you know, the movie came out. Uh -huh. <laughs> and we were playing a role-playing game yeah. of it. And so, I mean, I actually love the universe and I think it's great. And But it is actually, it's a third-person omniscient is a challenge for the reader. Yeah. And you can pull it off if you've got the skill sets. Um, but honestly, for the most part, it's it's a real challenge. Well, and again... <sighs> I want to point back to something that I that I said earlier, and that's that why why try to do the weird wonky thing when maybe perhaps just just stick with me on this. Perhaps theoretically you should get a grasp on the basic on just telling the scene from just one point of view before you start muddling and mucking with it. 
by introducing a whole bunch of random points of view within a couple paragraphs? Yeah, there's some authors that have done some really wild and kind of experimental type stuff. Oh, and we always we always see people, and we see people in the Writer Dojo Facebook group, which if you guys didn't know, there is a Writer, a writer Dojo Facebook group. Please join it. Um, I mean, we're obviously a little biased, but... Um, there's some good discussions. There's actually some wonderful discussions, and the group is so awesomely helpful. And we and love actually, you guys. A lot of really good source of information in there oh, too. Wonderful. So that's that's actually I've been I've been really happy to see how that's been shaken out. But we always see this. We see it in that group, or or some of our friends when it comes to shooting. We always see that they want to do like this weird zany off the wall like equipment pieces yeah. or they want to tell the story in this weird way, and we're they, like they, they want to like, do the, the pump hit. the brakes, guys. The unique snowflake thing is like, okay, so here's a thing that everybody does and like everybody who's really serious about this thing, I'll use shooting as an example. Everybody, like all the real hardcore serious shooters that train and practice and go to school and compete, carry their guns in a couple very similar ways, right? Yeah. And Steve's flashing me. <laughs> and the, Not in a sexy way. <laughs> Not in a sexy way. And the thing is... Then there's always this, some esoteric hipster on the internet who wants to do like some goofy, unique snowflake way that they're sure is just as good. And it's like all the other really smart people, you know, don't do it this way, probably for a reason, but they've got their goofy esoteric way that, and when you put it on the clock, it actually sucks. That's why no one does and it. And they complain, help, help, I'm being repressed. Or they shoot themselves on accident or, you know, shoot their friend. And the thing is... <laughs> Writing is the same way, guys, and you'll see that most people will do things a similar, like, and I'm not saying be uh, formulaic, I'm not saying copy the herd, but I'm saying, but there's some basic structural things that people tend to do because it works. Now, if you want to go out there and you want to, like, throw, like, like, the basics out the window and do your esoteric, weird, hipster thing, more power to you. You might be a bold, genius, artistic pioneer. You might get really lucky and sell a lot of copies uh, of that, but for the most part, it's it's not. And and the, those that do are, are that spike of brilliance. We know them for a reason. <laughs> it's because they're a rarity. Yeah, yeah. And 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 again, I don't want you guys to think that we're saying no. Don't do this. Don't write in say, for in this example. Don't write in third person omniscient. You're going to be bad at it. You might be good at it. You might be great. And you know what? If you want to go out there and see what it's like to write in third person omniscient, go for it. I'm, I'm going to encourage you till the end of the days. But I will say, how about you write like just a scene in third person omniscient and at the most a short story, just so you can kind of see how it is and see how it flows. Uh, and, and, and I think that if you do just that, you're going to get a pretty good idea of, of why we're not huge fans, but you might also go, oh, okay, I can see there being a good utility in this. Well, this is a tool I can use in X, in X scenario. Well, to be fair, like uh, third person omniscient, the sometimes where I've seen people pull it off and make it work where the whole book is not that way, but they'll have like a world buildy chapter, mm -hmm. like a history lesson chapter, or I've actually seen it used in space battles. Yeah. I have seen it used for space battles where you're talking big fleets of ships clashing across space. Uh, so there's not necessarily one narrator for that scene, but it's an omniscient narrator telling you about the fleets of ship clashing across millions of miles. Yeah. You know, I have seen that done. And, but then again, the rest of the book is still regular third person, uh, and there's a couple that we lump together like this. That they, I'm not trying to say I, I'm never going to be the guy that tells you don't do something. This is a rule. But the other ones are like obviously second person. You don't, uh, you don't see a lot of stuff written in second person for no. a reason. You know the the funny thing is, and I was going to say the other one was uh, present tense. Yeah, which is just hard to read. I'm, I'm not a fan of either of those, though. I have read stories in each of those that did work. Correct. Um, it, and, it can be done. And in fact, one of our you know one of our good buddies, Craig Nibo, who we've had on the show. Uh, and who graciously lets us use his studio. Yeah, big props to Craig here. Um, Buy his books. Yeah, he has he has a podcast called Terrifying Lies, which what he does is he, he takes some of his short stories, some of his, his productions, and he reads them, basically, and, and, you know, cues music to him because the dude is a, is a wicked awesome uh, musical, musician musical as well. Musical genius, yeah. But um, he did some stories 
that were in second person. And I think a couple of them are live right now on his podcast. But the idea was you're supposed to listen to them almost like it's like a hypno nightmare. Like the idea is that, that they, it, it's the audio is injecting you into the story. So it's told in second tense. Now in something like that, like I get it. Yeah. Like, uh, choose like your own adventure. It's yeah. choose your own adventure novel. Again, or it's a, a tool. Right. And, and there are, no matter how esoteric the tool is, think, think of any, think of all the random crap in your garage that you don't use. No matter how esoteric that, that tool is, there is a use for it. And that's the same with all this. Yep. Now, all that out the window. Because I don't want to talk about omniscient anymore because I hate it. <laughs> so, Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, third person limited, which is what we're talking about. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about some of the really cool things that we love about it and that we can do with it. No, doing with it. Like I like, I like going practical nuts and bolts hand on. Yeah. Um, one of the things about third person is I keep coming back to character cause I'm a very character driven storyteller. Yeah. As am I, but it's really, really cool to be able to get perspective. Don't forget perspective. It's not just the character is the narrator, but it's like, perspective colors reality we all have our you know the, you know the whole stupid live your truth or whatever but everybody's yeah. got a unique perspective on reality so if with the beautiful thing of this of having a handful of narrators i can color a scene however i want based upon the knowledge and personality of that person gives me it gives me some variability we talked about this in the horror episode a little bit if you want a scene to be more horrifying you don't put that scene from the perspective of the really capable dude who's going to handle his business and not freak out and be terrified you put that scene from the perspective of someone who's going to be scared and you make it visceral and you and you get that dread and you get that like cowering and helplessness oh my gosh they're so much more powerful and and so i like that that's one of the things that nuts and bolts thing that i love about third person well and and to add on to that what i think is really cool about that larry is when you when you when we talk about first person it's all i i i i saw this yeah and i and and oh the river of the river of eyes yeah, yeah and and i will always see that character for the most part will see another character and will and will have his perspective his or her perspective on that character and in general it's not going to change that much. It might change over the course of like long character arcs and stuff because characters change as they should. But in third person, you can have character A looking at character B and think, oh, well, this guy's just a tool and a moron and a blah, blah, blah. Well, then you switch to character C and character C is looking at character B. Hopefully you're all tracking this. And they're like, oh, Character B is amazing. I love Absolutely. character B. And it's because of this, this, and this. That's a wonderful tool. And I, I love that tool. I love that contrast because it, people are not just one thing, regardless of, of how you're looking at someone, they're not just one thing. Um, and so being able to paint a picture of another character from different angles, I think it actually can give you a much more complete picture of who the characters are which can help you really connect with those characters. Yeah. It's interesting you bring that up because I was thinking about for like when I'm writing Monster Hunter, uh, so every other book's first person, right? So I have the books from Owen Pitt's perspective as the main series of the books. And there's certain characters that Owen just hates. He just doesn't like them. And like Grant, like mm -hmm. Owen hated Grant from the moment he met him and will hate him forever. And yet a nemesis. And a nemesis we see him from an entirely different perspective. We see him through the eyes of other people. We see the world through his eyes. Oh, and I, and I challenge readers. I challenge readers because I went through the exact same thing. Throughout the first four books, I'm like, ugh, Grant. This guy. We can just shove him down a manhole and call it a day. <laughs> and yet in book five, we suddenly see him from these different perspectives. And, at, and by the end of book five, I was like, you know what? Grant's actually pretty cool. Yeah. I like Grant. The thing is, to be fair, the main character just hates his guts. 
And so you're colored by his opinion as the reader. And it's funny because the and the, I did that with the readers, and I, I flipped the script on uh, Myers too, a guy that everybody hated until they see the world from his perspective and why he does what he does. And all of a sudden, it's like, oh crap! I love doing that. I love that, and that's one of the best things about third person is being able to change that camera lens. And you can do it in first. But usually, sure. by you by do it by jarring the character with a new revelation, like oh, I thought so and so was just a jerk, but I just discovered that he spends all his time helping the orphan kittens. You know, the diabetic he gives insulin to diabetic kittens. Okay, yeah. whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and wow, my worldview has has changed. You know, yeah. and yeah, you can do that. And and uh, but being able to change perspectives entirely, uh, where you have one character who is just feared and hated. Uh, but by somebody else, they love them, you know, and they're and they're great. And one one of the other tools that I really like with third person, and I alluded to this at the top of the episode, and that's how you're able to hide and withhold information from the reader. Yeah, through third person, really effectively. With first person, if you're hiding the information, it's because they're not there. Uh, with third person, I mean, it's the same sort of thing. Maybe they're not there. But you don't have full access to the person's thoughts and feelings and minds. And so you can have dramatic, dramatic uh, heel turns with third person. You can have the, you know, the backstabbing. You can have people, you can have the characters be just as surprised by the revelation as the reader is. And, and I really like that sort of a tool. Um, I really like the ability to... This is going to sound bad. I really like the, the, the ability to manipulate the reader. Oh, absolutely. Um, it doesn't sound bad. That's what we're doing. It sounds honest. bad in the best way. Yeah. We're, 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 um, we're not emotional psychopaths here or anything, but it's our job. <laughs> it's our job to manipulate feelings and to evoke an emotional response. Yeah. And, and we do that through a series of cheap tricks. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I just remember the, the Arrested Development quote when you say that. They're not tricks. Tricks is something a whore does for money. And then he looks over and they're like, uh, and he goes, or candy. <laughs> <laughs> but that's basically what we do as writers. We're, 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 we're establishing these things and we're twisting it to get emotional response. And honestly... You know, it's this, these two episodes have made me kind of think about like what I do and try to like be analytical about stuff that mm -hmm. I, I don't really think about a lot of the stuff. It's just kind of instinct. I just kind of go with it and I've done this enough. I've got a lot of practice, but this episode is kind of, these two episodes have kind of forced me to like think through the process. And honestly, it comes back to, I don't think there's one better than the other. Oh no. It's just so, each one has so many good things you can use it for. Um, yeah, every every time I think I like one more than the other, like normally, I, normally I say, if 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 someone were on the street were to come up to me and say, which one do you like better, first person or third person? I generally will say first person, and yet, like I'm listening to the audiobook of of Servants of War, which is third person, and every time it switches to a different character, I'm like, oh right, here we go, nice, that's right, that's right, this is going to be fun, this is some fun stuff here, and I find myself. Loving it more and more. Yeah, and that's actually an interesting too, thing too. Is it, it's a tonal because we've talked about pacing before with the sine wave going up, going down, going up and down with pacing. Uh, by being able to change narrative perspective, it gives you a tonal shift too. So it's a reset for the reader to like get a refreshing. The only thing to watch out for, and I've seen this in some books. I don't want to name them because we we know the author. Uh, but where like they have three main characters, and it'll be character A, B, and C. And I love character A. Character A's chapters are great. Character B chapters, they're okay. Character C, I'm bored out of my mind. I hate character C. And they go A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C. And every time, as I'm going through, I'm like having fun, uh, having less go. fun. Here we go, this guy. Here, yeah. this this jackass uh, again. This guy. And so, and that, be careful with that. Don't yeah. go formulaic uh, and shift those tones around. So character C might be super vital, but you need to shift. Like, so we talk about Kristoff. Kristoff's dark. Kristoff's yeah. chapters are dark. Yeah. If we had the whole book from Kristoff's point of view. I'd be the darkest it'd be thing very, ever. It'd be very depressing. Because he's a, he's a secret policeman. 
like yeah. straight up, and he's good at his job, like like ruining people's lives and throwing them in the gulag. And oh, then, he likes it. Oh I was, yeah, I was just listening to a chapter where he was saying where the character is talking about how he's he's running around this like this this like front almost like frontier town that that they're in, and he's saying that he he hasn't found any any like traitors or spies yet, but if but if he goes too much longer, he might just have to find one just to alleviate the boredom, <laughs> you know, because, because that's the character that he is. Yeah. So see, we got to be careful because if we were to write an entire book from that guy's perspective, tonally it would be a very, very different book. But you jump between this guy and people who are, you know, decent human beings and it works. If you go too much in a row of that or, or, or don't even like make sure you stagger your cadence. So it's not just A, B, C, A, B, C, go A, A, B, B, C, A, A, B, C, A, C, C, B, you know, it's yeah, all over the place, all over the place, depending on what is most interesting. Now, one of the other things, and I think this goes along with what you're talking about, Larry, and that's. Um, when you're making these switches, I've read, a, I've read some books like this that have caused me to, to stop reading. And I'm not going to say which one this, which one these are. I generally read every book from start to finish once I started, but there's a few I've stopped. There's a few I wish I'd stopped. And Steve's read like 20,000 books. And I've books. read a lot of it's books. Like not even, I'm not even joking on that number. It's probably somewhere around that. Um, not as much these days, unfortunately. Um, but it's really rough when you're reading in third person and regardless of how much you like the character, when that POV just kind of stops, or maybe you're just getting into what that character's doing and then it switches to a new POV. Like you never quite reach like a fulfilling end to that scene. And it just either, either it drags on too long or it just stops way prematurely. And then you're yanked out of that and thrown into someone else. And it's like, you're having to restart a story over and over and over yeah, again. Yeah, that's one too. And I'm guilty of this because sometimes I'll, I, I will try to spread stuff out sequentially when I'm doing my chapters and I'll have chapters from different people's perspectives. But if I leave one character in a, in a dire situation and I don't resolve it and I drag it out for too many chapters before I revisit it, that's a danger. Well, the tension leaves. Right, because right. people will kind of forget about the tension that you left there. I can get away from that for a chapter or two, yeah, but I can't get away from that for five or six because by then they go back and they've kind of like, either they've been nagged by well, what happened with that or they get annoyed that I haven't answered that question yet. So if I'm going to leave them hanging for a chapter, I'm going to revisit that within another chapter or two rather than five or six. Yep. And I have done that before. And usually that's the one that you'll catch during editing. Yep. That's not one you'll usually catch because you as the writer, as you're writing the book, you know what happens next. You, you, you have in mind what's going to happen. You, so you don't have that narrative tension that the reader has. That's why when I get done reading a book, I take a week or two off. Then I go back and I read it again. Now I got fresh eyes like, oh, that's yeah. taken way too long. That's way too long. That's yeah. The, the, yeah, that's like a five chapter gap before I answer that question. Yeah. I need to go answer that question sooner. All right. You know, I think I think Larry will end up coming back to this topic eventually. There's a lot. There's a lot because there's so one. much to do here. And of course, if y'all have questions about this, um, if if some of the things we've talked about have have sparked a question in your mind, uh, please shoot the please shoot the questions in. Um, especially if you're a supporter, because we always we always answer our supporter questions. Please shoot those answers our, or those questions our way. We'll do our, our best to answer them. Sometimes either with the quick answer or, I mean, we've been known to to turn questions asked of us into complete topics before. So, as always, guys, we appreciate all of your support. Um, and again, remember, join the Facebook group, Writer Dojo. Uh, we have a lot of great people in there who are happy to answer a lot of these questions. We got a lot of actually really good experts in there, um, not just ourselves. And so, again, if you have any questions, go for that. You know, you can always ask them. But again, we'll come back to this again. We've got a lot to talk about. Uh, and, and we'll probably get some guests on who can, who can give you some, some other fresh perspectives, no pun intended, on this. So this is the Writer Dojo. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you on the next one. Writer Dojo is Steve Diamond and Larry Correa. Produced by Jack Wilder and Bear and Hair Studios. Theme song 
Word Mercenaries by Craig Naibo. New episodes come out every Wednesday wherever you stream your content. If you enjoyed this podcast, you can help support us by going to anchor.fm slash writer dojo, by leaving a five-star rating and review, and by helping to spread the word. To advertise on the Writer Dojo, email ads at writerdojo.com. All questions and comments can be emailed to questions at writerdojo.com. We're not emotional psychopaths here or anything, but it is our job...